Hey everyone, this is Daniel for Rock the JVM, and you are watching a tutorial on Scala metaprogramming basics with inlines. So, what is metaprogramming? Metaprogramming means the ability to program with other programs. So, code that manipulates other Scala code at compile time. Now, obviously, I'll assume that you're familiar with Scala basics. You won't need uh, too much to follow this tutorial. But I will recommend you try this out for yourself. I'll leave a link to the GitHub repository in the description. And I'll also include a written form on the blog on Rock the JVM. Now, this tutorial is standalone, and I recommend that you run this yourself. But it's part of a long form course on Scala 3 macros and metaprogramming that I've just published. So metaprogramming is easily the most magical feature set of Scala that very few people understand and many were looking to learn more about because documentation is pretty theoretical. So I made this course to cover pretty much everything you need to know about inlines, macros, AST manipulation, and pretty much all you need to be a master of metaprogramming. We write thousands of lines of code in the course, and uh, we also have two real-life projects to give you some uh, real practice with metaprogramming. And by the end of this course, you should have all the skills of a senior developer to be able to write libraries and tools and correctness checkers and various productivity improvements for your team. So if you're interested in the subject, I recommend that you check it out. I'm going to leave a link in the description. Now, to this day, uh, the power of Scala metaprogramming is at this point unmatched compared to other programming languages. There are many languages that do offer metaprogramming capabilities, for example, Lisp, but uh, they lose types. There are other languages that are strongly typed, but they only offer metaprogramming as text processors or compiler plugins, but nobody offers the kind of well-typed macros and metaprogramming in the same language in the same compiler pipeline as Scala does. So I really encourage you to uh, learn about macros and metaprogramming in general just for you to understand what is possible in a programming language. So with that being said, let me go to the actual code itself. So I've just created a very basic Scala project. Uh, so here under build SBT, you can create uh, your own Scala project. I've just added uh, a couple of uh, Scala compiler options. One that is very important for us is uh, this thing called uh, dash x print post inlining, which essentially prints the entire Scala code that uh, will end up being compiled after inlining, so after the metaprogramming part. And uh, this will uh, tell us essentially what's happening in the compiler that we are going to demonstrate in this tutorial. So we're going to focus our attention on this uh, inline basic thing. My object is called simple inlines. I might as well name my file that way. So simple inlines, okay. And I'm going to collapse build SPT and my file explorer and let's focus on inlines. All right, so if I start with a very simple function like uh, increment, increment with uh, an x that is an int, returns an int, and this is x plus one, let's say. If I have a val, uh, let's call this a number, which is three, if I uh, invoke this increment function, I'll obtain obviously the number four, so I'm gonna have val four as increment uh, a number. Now, let me check SBT output just for you to see what kind of output we should expect uh, and uh, the kind of uh, uh, tracking that we're going to do when uh, marking these functions inline. So let me go uh, not save this file yet. I'm going to uh, call SBT. And uh, in my SBT output, I'm gonna hit tilde compile. And uh, we're going to obtain essentially the final code that will be uh, compiled after inlining. So currently we have this uh, simple inline extends object and whatever, and we have uh, uh, okay, uh, just a basic object. Now, if I save this little file, simple inlines, we're going to essentially recompile everything, and now we're gonna have the method increment, a number is three, and val four is the invocation of this function, comruck the JVM inline, simple inlines increment on the a number variable. So this is the final code that will be compiled after uh, processing or metaprogramming. So the way that uh, Scala metaprogramming works is, is that everything that manipulates Scala code is going to essentially generate the final code that will be compiled and then that code is essentially well-typed Scala code that uh, will be subject to the rest of the compiler pipeline. Okay, so we can make uh, simple methods. Obviously, we can call them like uh, we do in uh, regular Scala code. This is nothing rocket science. But if I can uh, create a method increment, I'm going to call this inc with the same signature, but I'm going to mark it inline. Essentially, what inline does is it copies the implementation at the call site. So if I say val4 is, instead of increment, we have inc on a number. If I save this, uh, if I save this file, 
the val4 here is uh, copying a number uh, or it's copying the implementation of x plus 1, referring to x from wherever it was passed as an argument, which was the a number. So what we're going to obtain here in the output is the val4 is the variable a number plus 1. So essentially this compiles to or reduces to a number plus 1 at compile time. And the compile time thing is very important because inlines are a surprisingly powerful tool for metaprogramming. Now we can also inline the arguments to a function by passing them explicitly rather than evaluating them first before a function invocation. So for example, if I have, uh, let's call this product or uh, result as ink on, let's say two times a number plus one. So this is gonna be two times three plus one plus one, that's gonna be eight. And uh, having written this expression, let's check what the compiler output says. So uh, this generated the entire code again. This is not necessarily something that I'm uh, interested in. Okay, so look at this. We have the value eight saying the val proxy, which is two times the number plus one, and then we have this thing plus one. So this reduces two, so this reduces two, the a little block of code saying val, let's call this proxy, as two times a number plus one. And then we have proxy plus one. This is what the code says. So we have an intermediate variable and then we're doing this uh, proxy plus one. Now, with a feature called inline arguments, we can define a little method, let's call this inline function, and I'm going to call this ink with inline arguments. So ink with uh, inline arguments, I'm going to have inline x as an int, and I'm going to return x plus one. Well, in this case, val8 version two, as ink ia with two times a number plus one, in this case, it inlines where it expands the variable without evaluating it first directly in the method call. So this should reduce to, so reduces to two times a number plus one, which is the argument, plus one, which is the implementation. So this is going to be uh, the final expression that this will generate. So as I'm saving the file, let me scroll down. So look at this, we have eight version two is two times a number plus one, which is the argument, and then plus one, which is from the method body. So arguments can also be expanded exactly as they are without having to be computed first. Now, the interesting thing is that whenever the compiler sees the argument in the method body, it will simply expand that to whatever the expression was that we passed in the method invocation, which is very similar conceptually. So conceptually, uh, similar to a by name invocation. But this is done at compile time directly. So these are expanded within the method body. And only inline methods can have inline arguments. So again, inline arguments are expanded directly wherever the argument is being used. And if you use them multiple times, it will be expanded multiple times. So if I save this file and I check the compiling difference, look at this, we have two times this sucker plus two times this sucker plus one, okay? So uh, every time you have the argument, it will be expanded or it will be inlined. The difference between inline argument and the by name invocation is that this is done at compile time. So only that the args are expanded at compile time. So this fact of the uh, expansion at compile time is super, super, super important. And this will allow us to do metaprogramming with uh, the kind of uh, techniques that I'm going to show you throughout the rest of this course. Now, a practical direct implication of using inlines, aside from the kind of information that's being serviced at compile time, is that inlines can be used for performance optimization. Because instead of method calls, you have the method body directly injected into the code. And uh, I can give you a, a quick example for that. So uh, let me define a method test inline. And, uh, and I'm going to replicate an example that I just saw on the internet a couple of days ago, um, where people were bragging that JavaScript is fast. Well, 
With inlines, you can uh, write pretty darn fast Scala code on the JVM. So I'm going to uh, replicate a little for loop or a double for loop. So uh, people used to have like a, an array, so array of like 10,000 elements, and then uh, it would have a for i from zero to the length of the array. So from one to 10,000, so they will do a double for loop. So for j uh, as a zero to 10k, they would do something like uh, array of i plus equals a random constant. And out of this would have array of i plus equals another random constant. And uh, they would measure the time it takes for uh, something like this to happen on uh, various languages. And Python was surprisingly slow and whatever. But I, w I wanted to uh, give you a little demonstration of how this looks like for regular Scala code versus inline Scala code. So I'm gonna replicate a little for loop via a little method. So I'm gonna say uh, loop with uh, an, so I'm gonna have an inline, inline def loop with uh, a little type parameter, let's say inline start as an A, inline condition with a Boolean and inline advance as A to A. So just to replicate a regular C style for loop and also an inline body or an inline uh, action as A to pretty much anything, okay? And uh, I'm going to write variables here. So I'm going to say var a start, and then I'm going to say while uh, condition on a, I'm going to say action on a, and then I'm going to advance. So a is equal to advance on a. So this is essentially me replicating a for loop in Scala, okay? And uh, I'm using variables and while loops. And uh, if you're at this course, I'm pretty sure you're not dogmatic about this. Uh, variables and while loops are really powerful if you want to write really performant code. So um, I'm going to have this inline def loop and I'm going to replicate this sucker. So I'm going to have a val start as, let's say, system current time millis just to measure time. So I'm going to call this start. Then I'm going to have a val uh, r, which is a random number. I'm going to say random next int, let's say 10,000. And I'm going to create another one. I'm going to call this u. And then I'm gonna run a uh, quote unquote for loop, which is my loop function. So I'm gonna say loop starting at zero. The condition is thing is less than 10,000. And then I'm gonna say underscore plus one. So it's like a for loop in Java, but uh, this is a uh, function with multiple argument lists. So I'm gonna say I and I'm gonna have another loop with uh, zero and then 100,000. So underscore is less than 100,000 and underscore plus one and given a J inside. Okay, then I'm going to write uh, an array. Let me define the array. So val array as array dot of dim of type integer. I'm going to have 10,000 numbers. I'm gonna say array of I is equal to array of I plus uh, u and finally after the first loop I'm going to say array of i is equal to array of i plus this other random variable which is r. So then I'm going to have a print line so print line I'm going to say inline version and uh, I'm going to inject a little expression here so I'm going to have a system current time millis minus the start divided by 1000 so this is an expression. I'm going to divide this by 1000.0. So this is going to be the number of seconds. Okay. So this is going to be my little for loop. But uh, this is going to be the inline version. And I'm also going to use a no inline version. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to call this test to no inline. I'm going to cut out all the inlines from the function definition. So this loop is just a regular function with a bunch of parameters. Nothing is inline. And uh, I'm gonna say no inline version. Okay. And uh, I'm gonna type in a main. So main with args as array string. And uh, this is going to be a test inline and then test no inline. That's it. So this is gonna be my little application. And in another terminal, I'm going to start another SBT. Okay, and then I'm gonna say run 
main. And then I'm going to uh, say comrock the JVM and I have simple inlines. Comrock the JVM inline simple inlines. Okay, so inline version is 0.1 second. No inline version is 1.5 seconds. So like 15 times performance improvement just by adding inlines. And uh, it actually makes sense because in the double for loop, we um, don't have function calls, but rather we have uh, while loops. So no function calls and no indirection. And uh, that causes all this uh, extra overhead. So inlines can help with performance improvement. But uh, the place where we're going to spend most of our time is in the information that the inline surface to the compile time for metaprogramming. Okay, so this is one of the main uh, reasons why I am going to focus on inlines and also macros in the beginning of the next chapter. So I just wanted to add performance optimization here because it's obvious and uh, because it's also an uh, important outcome of using inlines. Now the final feature of inlines that I wanted to show you in this video is transparent inlines. And transparent inlines means that uh, the most concrete type definition of a function is going to be surfaced to the compiler because the compiler has access to those concrete times at compile time. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to have an inline function. So an inline def, let's call this wrap, that takes an item as an int, and this returns an option int. Okay, And then I'm going to return a sum. So look at this. We are declaring that this function returns an int, but it actually returns a more concrete type than option. It returns a subtype of option. Now, if I define a val, let's call this uh, an option, as option int as wrap with the number seven, obviously that's correct because the option int conforms to the type signature of this method. And uh, obviously this compiles and uh, the type checker is okay. Now, if I prefix this definition with a QR transparent, what the transparent method does is that depending on the number that you pass inside or depending on the uh, uh, compile time information that the body of the method gives to the compiler, I can use more concrete types than the one declared in the function signature. So with a transparent keyword, I should be able to say val a sum, which is a sum int, and I'm gonna say wrap seven. And this is also okay. But it's also okay only in the context of transparent. If I cut this out and I save this, wrap7 is not okay because wrap7 declares to be an option int and the implementation is opaque to the compiler. But otherwise, if the expression of the function is transparent to the compiler, then the type, the most concrete type of this expression can be used by the compiler to do some extra type checks. So this is also okay only if transparent. So you can see here that some methods can be declared transparent and even have the type signature any or uh, whatever uh, very general type, but the compiler can have access to the uh, uh, concrete method implementation and that expression can give much more information than just the signature of the method, thereby allowing the compiler to do more rigorous type checks than by just looking at the type signature. All right, folks, this was an introduction to inlines in Scala. I hope I stimulated your appetite for metaprogramming. And if so, check out the long-form course on Scala 3 macros and metaprogramming that I've just launched. I think you'll enjoy it. And uh, until next time, this was Daniel for Rock the JVM signing off.